The Marvel Cinematic Universe has been going strong since 2008, but as of Phase 5, its story covers thousands of years. Need to catch up on the latest developments? Ah, uh, let's just go through the whole thing. Uh, where to start? Um... If you really want to know where things started in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have to go all the way back to before the Big Bang. No, really. Before the beginning of the universe, before even the creation of the six singularities that caused the universe to explode into existence, there were the Celestials, beings of infinite cosmic power. The Celestials, led by Arishem the Judge, created the original planets, stars, and life forms of the infant universe following the Big Bang. Realizing they need help to expand the universe and create more life, the first Celestials seed planets with embryonic Celestials. These new gods would be born once sentient life on each planet rose to a critical juncture, allowing for the emergence of a new Celestial and resulting in the destruction of that world. To assist in this process, the Celestials genetically engineered deviant monsters to wipe out the apex predators of each world, encouraging sentient life to develop and multiply. Unfortunately, the Celestials miscalculated. The Deviants did their job so well, they started hunting down and killing all life forms, preventing emergences. To keep them in check, the Celestials created the Eternals, synthetic life forms sent to different worlds across the cosmos to kill the Deviants and protect the planet's life forms. Regarded as gods and superheroes by the populace, the Eternals are unknowingly preparing the planets for their destruction. Following each emergence, the Eternals' memories are wiped so they could be reused on different worlds. Meanwhile, other interesting things are happening throughout the universe. The six singularities that created the cosmos became the Infinity Stones, objects that controlled fundamental forces like time, space, and reality itself. They were then scattered across the universe, popping up here and there and awaiting the eventual arrival of a giant golden oven mitt that would be used by a purple sociopath to kill off half the universe. That, of course, was billions of years ago, but it's not the only thing to happen in those long eons. Millions of years before we get to the present-day MCU, Ego the Living Planet comes into existence, gains cosmic awareness, and seeds thousands of worlds with his essence in an attempt to create another celestial being like himself. But though he may in fact be a godlike figure, in the end he's still essentially just a selfish deadbeat dad. No wonder Peter has issues. Well, of course I have issues! <laughs> That's my freaking father! While Ego considers most of his early attempts at offspring failures and kills them out of disappointment, he does keep at least one of his kids around, the insect-like woman Mantis, whose empathic abilities help Ego sleep. As far as heroes and villains of Earth are concerned, the MCU doesn't start with Tony Stark getting kidnapped in 2008, Carol Danvers being taken to Hala in the 90s, or even with Steve Rogers volunteering for the Super Soldier program in the 40s. The actual beginning happened in 5000 BC, when ten immortal Eternals, Cersei, Icarus, Ajax, Kinga, Sprite, Fastos, Makari, Thena, Druig, and Gilgamesh arrived on Earth to take out the Deviants on our planet. For thousands of years, the Eternals protected emerging humankind, largely through epic super battles with giant monsters. By 1521, the Eternals finally managed to defeat all the Deviants on Earth, or so they think. Lacking any real direction now that their main reason for coming to the planet is gone, they scatter and get jobs as teachers, Bollywood film stars, and South American cult leaders. Since the Celestials have instructed the Eternals not to interfere in humanity unless Deviants were involved, other godlike beings get the chance to descend onto Earth and have their time to shine. These include the Asgardians, vastly powerful alien beings who visit our planet many times and give rise to Norse mythology. Still, the most exciting stuff those guys were up to happens off-world in the realm of Asgard. This mythological timescale begins millennia ago, as we find out in Thor The Dark World, when the dark elf Malekith the Accursed lays siege to Asgard using a weapon known as the Aether, actually an infinity stone that controls reality, to revert the universe to a state of perpetual darkness. Malekith is fought off by Bor, the father of Odin. In 2988 BC, Bor vanquishes Malekith, which turns out to be a temporary solution. 
causing the Dark Elves to go into a state of hibernation for the next 5,000 years, or then buries the ether on a distant world. While we don't know exactly when it happens, the next chronological event that we see from our characters is Odin's conquest of the Nine Realms alongside his first child, Hela, goddess of death. During this era, the magic warhammer Mjolnir is forged in the heart of a dying star and used by Hela. Thanks to her bloodthirsty ruthlessness and ambition, Odin turns against her, and in the battle that follows, Hela slaughters the Valkyrior. The sole surviving Valkyrie flees from Asgard, spending the next few thousand years drunk and depressed. Eventually, she winds up on Sakaar, a cosmic garbage dump that an immortal being called the Grand Master builds into an interstellar gladiatorial arena. Hela is then imprisoned in another dimension by Odin, who covers up all traces of her existence. Sometime after that, but still far enough back that people were writing about it in the 13th century, Odin and Frigga have a son, Thor. Shortly thereafter, Odin slays the frost giant Laufey and adopts his son Loki as his own. Not too long after this, during their youth, Loki turns into a snake because he knows Thor loves snakes and then tries to stab him. In one universe, he manages to succeed. What was your nexus event, your majesty? I killed Thor. Also, millions of years before the present day, two meteors made out of the supermetal vibranium strike the Earth. One meteor lands in Africa, drastically affecting the surrounding area. Much, much later, this area becomes the country of Wakanda, when a warrior shaman receives a vision from the goddess Bast, ingests a vibranium-altered heart-shaped herb that grants him great powers, and founds a dynasty of warrior kings known as the Black Panthers. The Wakandans become secretive and isolationist, remaining unconquered throughout history and using the vibranium to create fantastic technology away from the eyes of the outside world. The second meteor crashes into the Atlantic Ocean near the Yucatan. It mutates the undersea plant life, imbuing many species with mutagenic properties. In 1571, a Yucatan Mayan tribe dying of the smallpox virus introduced by the Spanish colonizers came across one of these vibranium-altered plants which mutated them into a water-breathing people. The tribe migrated to the Puerto Rico Trench and built the underwater kingdom of Telocan, using the rich deposits of vibranium beneath the sea. One Teloconal woman is pregnant when the plant mutates her, causing her to give birth to a mutant child. Born with winged feet, superhuman strength, and a very long lifespan, the child develops a hatred for surface dwellers when he sees a plantation owner abuse his Mayan slaves. After the Telokan boy orders his people to burn down the plantation, a dying priest calls the young mutant El Nino Sin Amor, the child without love, which the boy adopts as his new name, Namor. Namor rules over his kingdom for centuries and becomes known as Kukul Khan, or the feathered serpent god by his people. Over 5,000 years before the present day, a faction of the militaristic alien race called the Kree arrives on Earth and conducts experiments on humans, creating the early Inhumans. One of these Inhumans, known as Hive, drives the Kree from the Earth and establishes a cult of personality that regards him as a god. After being banished, his followers work to restore him while destabilizing Earth's society. Over time, this society becomes the terrorist organization Hydra. Moving to just about a thousand years before the present day, the warlord Shu Winwu makes a fantastic discovery of his own when he comes across ten otherworldly rings that grant him immortality and the strength of a god. Using the rings to establish his Ten Rings criminal organization, Winwu conquers kingdoms and topples governments, amassing an incredible power structure that influences the direction of the world. Over in Eastern Europe, the demonic entity Tutone writes a set of spells in a structure at the top of Mount Wondagor. The original text is then copied into a more portable book, the Darkhold, that falls into the hands of several dark magic users, including the witch Morgan Le Fay. Elsewhere, a Celtic woman trains in the mystic arts to protect the Earth against magical threats. After drawing power from the Dark Dimension, she becomes functionally immortal and takes on the name the Ancient One. 
In 1693, the witch Agatha Harkness escapes being burned at the stake by her mother and a bunch of other witches who aren't happy with her practice of dark magic. She drains their life energies and gets her hands on the Darkhold before disappearing to get into all sorts of trouble before she pops up again in the present day. Jumping ahead to 1942, a Nazi officer known as Johann Schmidt experiments on himself with an early version of Dr. Abraham Erskine's Super Soldier Serum, gaining both a physically perfect body and a decidedly redder complexion. Now calling himself the Red Skull, he takes charge of a splinter group called Hydra. With the discovery of one of the Infinity Stones in the form of the Tesseract, he creates a technologically advanced army of his own. That same year, Steve Rogers volunteers for the strategic scientific reserves attempt at creating a super soldier using a technique created by Dr. Erskine. The project works, giving Steve the body of a hunky Chris Evans. After the experiment, Erskine is assassinated and his research is lost. Rather than risking their only super soldier by sending him to fight in the war, the SSR gives Steve the codename Captain America and uses him primarily as a spokesman to sell war bonds and USO shows set to an extremely catchy song. Eventually, Steve goes AWOL to rescue his best friend Bucky Barnes and becomes an active soldier in the war, working with tech genius industrialist Howard Stark, falling in love with SSR agent Peggy Carter, and leading a strike team called the Howling Commandos. On one of their missions, Bucky falls from a train into a ravine, seemingly to his death. However, Bucky is actually taken into custody by the Soviet army, given cybernetic enhancements, and brainwashed into becoming a super assassin, codenamed Winter Soldier. After attempting to use the Tesseract, the Red Skull is sucked into a wormhole, becoming the second person in Captain America the First Avenger to survive an apparent death. In reality, he winds up on the distant planet Vormir, serving as a sort of spectral guardian for the Soul Stone. As for Steve, he crashes a bomber jet into the Arctic to keep Hydra from destroying New York. He is also presumed dead, but he survives, frozen in suspended animation for the next 66 years. Jeez, doesn't anyone who dies in this movie actually die? You ready to follow Captain America into the jaws of death? Hell no. While things are pretty quiet for the MCU between 1945 and 1995, there are a few notable exceptions. Peggy Carter continues to work for the SSR, first in New York in 1946 and then in Los Angeles alongside Howard Stark in 1947. Although Hydra is believed to have been destroyed, it actually secretly infiltrates the US government, quietly influencing historical events. Around this time, the Soviet Union produces the first graduates of its brutal Red Room facility, where orphaned girls are trained as spies and assassins, codenamed Black Widows. During the 1950s, Korean War veteran Isaiah Bradley and several other African-American soldiers are unknowingly subjected to a new version of the Super Soldier Serum. Isaiah gains superhuman abilities and is sent on secret missions, including one where he battles a still brainwashed Bucky Barnes and learns his identity. Isaiah subsequently goes AWOL to save his fellow soldiers from a POW camp. In the aftermath, all the soldiers except Isaiah die from the serum's side effects. Isaiah is imprisoned for 30 years so CIA and Hydra scientists can experiment on him and try to replicate the serum in his blood. Eventually, a nurse takes pity on Isaiah and has him declared dead, allowing Isaiah to return to Baltimore, Maryland and live with his family. Sometime after this, presumably around 1948 or 49, Steve Rogers travels back in time from 2023 to reunite with Peggy. She continues to work in military intelligence for the next few decades with Stark, whose defense contracts turn Stark Industries into the world's leading arms manufacturer. By 1970, both of them are working out of SSR headquarters at Camp Lehigh, along with a few other notable figures. Arnhem Zola, who worked with the Red Skull back in the 40s, is stationed here, and although his body dies in the 70s, his brain is transferred into a computer data bank that continues Hydra's infiltration of the government. Also, Hank Pym is working here, assisted by Bill Foster in his experiments with the size-changing Pym particles that will allow him and his wife Janet Van Dyne to become the original Ant-Man and Wasp. Between the 70s and the 90s, several small but key events happen throughout the MCU. In 1974, Howard Stark launches the Stark Expo, displaying the city of the future, powered by a clean energy arc reactor that's about the size of a house. 
For some reason, he also hides the structure of a new element in the arrangement of the buildings, which is the kind of science it pays to not think too hard about. Congratulations, sir. You have created a new element. In 1980, Ego comes to Earth, winning the heart of Meredith Quill. Nine months later, their son, Peter Quill, is born. In 1987, Janet Van Dyne is lost in the quantum realm after she and Hank Pym attempt to stop a rogue Soviet missile targeting the United States. In 1988, Meredith Quill dies from brain cancer, intentionally caused by Ego, leaving her son a mixtape of classic rock favorites. Peter is then abducted by a band of outer space outlaws called the Ravagers. Their leader, Yandu, then raises Peter as a son. To keep up appearances, Yandu treats Peter harshly in front of the Ravagers, but shows the boy great affection privately even giving Peter a pair of laser pistols as a Christmas gift and teaching him valuable survival skills. In 1987, Janet Van Dyne and Hank Pym attempt to stop a rogue Soviet missile targeting the United States. To destroy the missile, Janet intentionally shuts off her size-changing regulator and shrinks through the missile's molecules. She continues shrinking right into the subatomic quantum realm, devastating both her husband and her young daughter, Hope. Pym spends the next several years studying the quantum realm, unintentionally estranging himself from his daughter. By 1989, Pym resigns from the SSR, now renamed the Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division, after finding out that they intend to use his Pym particles to create weapons. Also that year, Air Force Captain Carol Danvers, who uses the call sign Avenger during her flights, volunteers for a test flight of a light speed engine created by scientist Wendy Lawson. Lawson turns out to be one of the Kree, a militaristic alien race constantly at war with the shape-shifting Skrulls, and her engine is powered by the Tesseract. When they're shot down, Carol's body is overloaded with the Tesseract's energy, giving her incredible powers and also wiping her memory. A Kree soldier named Jan Rog abducts her and takes her back to the Kree homeworld of Hala where she is made to believe that she's actually a Kree named Veers, fighting alongside them as a member of the Kree Star Force. While all of this is happening on Earth, things continue to develop in space. Thanos, an incredibly powerful alien from the planet Titan who's obsessed with balance, begins to seek out the Infinity Stones. Along the way, he lays waste to half of the population of entire planets, occasionally taking young survivors and training them as soldiers. Assuming that most of the more humanoid characters are the same age as the people portraying them, then his two most notable adoptions happen in the late 80s or early 90s. Gamora is taken in as a young girl after Thanos kills half of the population of her home planet. Throughout her childhood, Thanos pits her against her adopted sister, Nebula. Every time they spar, Gamora wins and Thanos systematically replaces pieces of Nebula's body with cybernetic parts in order to make her a more efficient killer. This creates a lot of resentment in Nebula, not only against Thanos, but also toward Gamora, which will greatly affect their later relationship. Elsewhere in the galaxy, a geneticist known as the High Evolutionary starts Orgocorp, an intergalactic company that produces bioengineered products to benefit all life. However, Orgocorp is actually a front to fund the High Evolutionary's illegal genetic experiments and allow him to create his vision of a perfect society. His experiments result in the Sovereign, a highly advanced, golden-skinned race, and the Humanimals, intelligent, humanoid animals. While many of the High Evolutionary's creations consider him a god, the High Evolutionary sees them as disposable experiments and regularly destroys entire planets when his subjects don't live up to his expectations. One of the High Evolutionary's experiments is Subject 89P13, a cybernetically enhanced raccoon with a genius intellect who renames himself Rocket. Believing the High Evolutionary will take him and his fellow experiments, Lila, Teefs, and Floor, to live in peace on a new planet, Rocket helps him with his experiments. However, when the High Evolutionary kills his friends, a devastated rocket mauls the High Evolutionary's face and escapes. He becomes a bounty hunter and adopts a bitter, cynical attitude to help him deal with his trauma. Meanwhile, in the Quantum Realm, a stranded Janet Van Dyne comes across another castaway, an exiled variant of Nathaniel Richards named Kang the Conqueror. Initially believing Kang to be benevolent, Janet helps him rebuild his damaged multiversal power core so they can escape the realm. 
However, when she realizes what a monster Kang really is, she enlarges the power core so it can't be used, trapping them both in their subatomic prison. Unfortunately, Kang is still able to charge his armor and use its power to create the city of Axia, the capital of his fascist empire. Feeling responsible, Janet joins a resistance movement against Kang. In 1991, the Soviet government sends the Winter Soldier to assassinate Howard and Maria Stark. This will have massive ramifications later on, but the immediate effect is that their brilliant slacker son, Tony Stark, is left in charge of Stark Industries, along with Obadiah Stane as CEO. They continue to manufacture weapons using Tony's increasingly deadly designs, selling them to all sides of virtually every global conflict, with Obadiah in particular making a profit from secret arms deals with terrorist groups. In 1992, King T'Chaka of Wakanda goes to Oakland, California to investigate arms deals involving stolen vibranium. The culprit is his brother, Injobu, who is killed in the altercation. Injobu's son, Eric, is a witness to the whole thing and grows up craving revenge. He joins the Navy SEALs and becomes part of a CIA black ops unit, killing hundreds of people around the world. Around the same time, Nine-year-old Matt Murdock is blinded by a drum of toxic waste while trying to save a man from being hit by a truck. The chemicals heighten his other senses to superhuman levels, allowing him to move and fight better than before. After his father is killed by mobsters, an orphaned Matt is mentored by the blind warrior Stick, who trains him to use his senses as weapons. Stick later abandons the boy, but Matt continues training and studying, eventually becoming both a gifted fighter and law student. Meanwhile, Russian super soldier Alexei Shostakov and Black Widow weapons designer Melina Vostikov go deep undercover in Ohio, posing as an all-American family with their so-called daughters, seven-year-old Natasha Romanoff and three-year-old Yelena Belova. While Alexei and Melina work to steal a S.H.I.E.L.D., or actually HYDRA, project focused on free will and mind control, Natasha and Yelena experience some semblance of a normal childhood. By 1995, however, the mission is complete and the family flees to Cuba. However, once they arrive, they are split apart, and Natasha and Yelena return to the Red Room, where they continue their Black Widow training slash torture sessions. Also in 1995, Carol Danvers, still without her memories of Earth, returns to her home planet after escaping from the Skrulls. She teams up with S.H.I.E.L.D. agents Nick Fury and Phil Coulson to stop the Skrulls from invading Earth, only to learn that they're not actually the bad guys. Instead, it's the Kree that are the problem, with Yanrog and Ronan the Accuser en route in search of the Infinity Stones that will end their war of conquest once and for all. Carol, taking the name Captain Marvel, fights them off and saves a bunch of Skrull refugees. In the process, an alien cat scratches Nick Fury's left eye, blinding it and causing him to sport a fashionable eye patch. Before she journeys back into space to aid the Skrulls, Carol gives Fury a pager that can summon her in case of a dire emergency. Inspired by Carol and her original call sign, Fury lays the groundwork for the Avengers Initiative, a program designed to create a team of superpowered heroes to deal with large-scale threats like alien invasions. In 1996, Wenwu, having used his Ten Rings organization to secretly conquer or influence practically everything on Earth, turns his attention to the mystical realm of Tala. After finding a magical forest near the village entrance, he meets and falls in love with the village guardian, Ying Li. The two marry and have two children, Shang-Chi and Xiaoling. For a time, Wenwu reforms, but when his wife is killed by his rivals, he decides to recreate the Ten Rings and train his son, Shang-Chi, to be a living weapon. Around the same time in Chicago, Illinois, a young Mark Spector and his little brother Randall are exploring a cave when it suddenly floods, drowning Randall. Mark's mother, Wendy, blames him for the accident, and a traumatized Mark manifests the alternate personality of Stephen Grant to help him cope with his mother's verbal and physical abuse. In 1999, Tony Stark meets bioengineers Maya Henson and Aldrich Killian at a conference in Bern, Switzerland. He's very rude to Aldrich, who remembers that as a sore point for about 14 years. Throughout all this, Hydra continues its secret infiltration of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all levels of the United States government. All that brings us to 2008 and Iron Man, the movie that launched the MCU. Almost everything from here on plays out in chronological order, in the years the movies were actually released. Almost. 
In 2008, Tony Stark is demonstrating his newest weapons in the Middle East when he's kidnapped by a terrorist organization called the Ten Rings, in what will eventually be revealed as a plot by Stane to get Tony out of the picture. While he's imprisoned, the terrorists force him and another captive, Dr. Ho Yinsen, who was also at that fateful 1999 convention in Bern, not that Tony noticed, to make weapons for them. Instead, Tony is able to recreate a miniaturized version of his father's arc reactor, using it to stabilize a piece of shrapnel that's lodged near his heart. The reactor also powers the Iron Man, a suit of weaponized armor built from scrap, which allows Tony to escape after Jensen's death. Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave with a box of scraps. He returns to America, eats a cheeseburger, refines his design, and wipes out the Ten Rings, the ones in the Middle East at least, in a brutally effective display of the Iron Man's weapons. He also defeats Stane, who attempts to kill Tony and create his own massive suit of powered armor. Tony then publicly reveals his identity as Iron Man, causing Nick Fury to approach him about the Avengers initiative. Around the same time as Tony's capture, Dr. Bruce Banner, whose seven PhDs apparently include physics and biological engineering, is working on recreating the Super Soldier program. Instead of Erskine's Vita rays, he uses gamma radiation, testing it on himself and turning himself into a rampaging, green, monstrous Hulk whenever he gets angry. After the Hulk inadvertently injures Banner's girlfriend, Betty Ross, he attempts to go underground but returns to America in search of a cure for his condition. He winds up dealing with a scientist named Samuel Stearns, who wants to recreate the Hulk, and a soldier called Emil Blonsky, who turns himself into a similarly hulking monster called the Abomination. Ultimately, the Hulk defeats the Abomination, who's sent to prison, and Stearns absorbs some of Banner's blood, causing his brain to mutate. Banner then goes back into hiding and starts learning how to control his transformations. Also around this time, S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Clint Barton, aka Hawkeye, is tasked with finding and eliminating Natasha Romanoff, the Black Widow. Barton tracks down Natasha to her safe house in Budapest, but feels Natasha wants out of the Red Room, so he lets her live. S.H.I.E.L.D. decides to let Natasha defect to their side, but requires her to kill her overseer, General Drakoff, first. Natasha and Clint rig a five-story building with bombs and lure the Red Room's mastermind into the kill zone but Dracoff's young daughter, Antonia, also gets caught in the explosion. While disturbed by the additional red in her ledger, Natasha nevertheless begins working for S.H.I.E.L.D. Six months after revealing his identity publicly, Tony Stark is called to testify before Congress. Because they are justifiably concerned about a private citizen building a suit of armor that can vaporize a tank, to create their own version, they turn to rival weapons manufacturer Justin Hammer. After Tony's friend, Colonel James Rhodes, delivers a prototype Iron Man suit, Hammer and Russian scientist Ivan Venko reverse-engineer them into an army of drones. Stark also gets a new personal assistant, an undercover Natasha, going by the name Natalie. I want one. No. Stark and Rhodes, equipped with his own militarized suit of armor codenamed War Machine, defeat Venko and Hammer. Over at the Ten Rings compound, a now 14-year-old Shang-Chi has become the master of Kung Fu, having been taught every possible way to kill a man over the last seven years. Assigned to assassinate the man responsible for his mother's murder, Shang-Chi completes his mission but is badly traumatized. Unwilling to return to his father, Shang-Chi cleverly adopts the name Shan and starts going to high school in San Francisco. There he meets his best friend Katie, a skilled driver. Meanwhile, a now-adult Mark Spector leaves home to join the United States Marine Corps, but gets discharged because of his dissociative identity disorder. With few options, Mark becomes a mercenary and works for his former commanding officer Raoul Bushman. In addition to doing some jobs for the CIA, Mark is ordered by Bushman to execute some archaeologists at an Egyptian dig site. Instead, Mark tries to save the scientists, but gets shot, dying. Spectre is approached by the Egyptian god of the moon, Khonshu, who offers to save Spectre if he will become his avatar and punish evildoers on Earth. Seeing himself as little more than a killer thanks to his childhood abuse, Spectre agrees and is transformed into the supernatural vigilante, Moon Knight. While all this is happening on Earth, there's other stuff going on in the golden realm of Asgard. 
Loki tricks Thor into antagonizing the Frost Giants of Jotunheim against Odin's orders. As a consequence, Odin exiles Thor to Earth and enchants his hammer, Mjolnir, so that only someone worthy of Thor's power can lift it. It lands in New Mexico, where Agent Coulson discovers it. After a bunch of hicks try to yank it out of the ground with pickup trucks, S.H.I.E.L.D. constructs a temporary facility around it. Thor eventually proves himself worthy, regains his hammer, and stops Loki from staging a coup in Asgard. In 2011, a team of Russian oil drillers discovers the crashed Hydra plane in the Arctic and alerts S.H.I.E.L.D. Captain America is thought out and revived, and after realizing he's in the 21st century, he joins up with Nick Fury's Avengers Initiative. It turns out he was just in time. In 2012, Loki, last seen adrift in space after his failed coup in Asgard, is enlisted by Thanos to recover the Tesseract from Earth. With his recent brief visit to the planet being seen by the Mad Titan as relevant employment experience. In exchange, Thanos gives him control of the Chitari, a massive army of hive-minded destroyers, and a scepter containing the Mind Stone, another of the Infinity Stones. Using these weapons, Loki lets himself be captured by S.H.I.E.L.D., incites a riot, and stabs poor Phil Coulson in the back. But don't worry, he gets better. The ensuing ruckus provides the superheroes with a reason to come together. The result is the Battle of New York, in which the Avengers, Captain America, Iron Man, Thor, Black Widow, Hulk, and Hawkeye are gathered for the first time as a team. The good guys win after Loki is smashed against the ground five or six times, but the battle is not without its consequences. Unlike in the real world, where it's pretty nice these days, the MCU's version of Hell's Kitchen takes a lot of damage and winds up being a center of corruption and graft as it's rebuilt. This injustice leads blind lawyer Matt Murdock to take on the identity of Daredevil to fight against criminal kingpin Wilson Fisk, and eventually team up with other super-powered street-level crime fighters – Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and kinda sorta The Punisher – on Netflix. The reconstruction of New York is mostly handled by the newly formed Department of Damage Control, who take over the lucrative contract and leave construction foreman Adrian Toombs in bitter and in possession of advanced alien technology. Toombs builds his own underground criminal enterprise, selling reverse-engineered Chitari weapons on the black market. While the Battle of New York comes with its fair share of trauma, it also leaves some people inspired. After seeing Clint Barton unknowingly saving her life while battling aliens with a bow and arrow, 10-year-old Kate Bishop decides to take up archery and learn martial arts in an attempt to protect her family against future threats. She turns out to be a gifted, if extremely reckless, prodigy who often damages public property with her trick shots. In 2013, Tony Stark in particular is overwhelmed by the concept of his universe suddenly expanding to include gods, aliens, and other unknowable cosmic forces. He deals with post-traumatic stress, which unfortunately coincides with the return of Aldrich Killian. Killian has been experimenting with Maya Hansen's regenerative extremis treatment, which has the unfortunate tendency to cause its subjects to explode. To cover his operations, Killian appropriates Wenwu's Ten Rings and creates a fictional terrorist based on Wenwu called the Mandarin hiring an actor named Trevor Slattery to play him in threatening videos. The plot is uncovered and stopped by Tony and Rhodey. I wouldn't go in there for 20 minutes. <laughs> in the aftermath, Killian is killed by Pepper Potts, and Slattery gets sent to federal prison, where he's later abducted by the real Ten Rings for impersonating Winwu. Although Winwu is intent on killing this strange man who named himself after a chicken dish, he has a change of heart after seeing how good Slattery is at performing Shakespeare and decides to make him his jester. Around this time, Phil Coulson resurfaces and begins recruiting some additional members into his own Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They have their own adventures, including many involving the Inhumans and Ghost Rider, but like the good secret agents they are, a lot of this flies beneath the radar of most major MCU events. Oh, also Malekith comes back and Thor fights him and Loki becomes the latest in a long line of presumed deaths that actually aren't. He stashes Odin in a retirement home in New York, and then takes his identity, ruling over Asgard and putting on critically acclaimed plays. I'm sorry about that thing with the Tesseract. I just couldn't help myself. I know. I'm a trickster. Yes. 
In 2014, Hydra's decades-long plot to infiltrate and take over America is finally discovered by Captain America and Black Widow, who also learn that the Winter Soldier is a brainwashed Bucky Barnes. While Cap fights to restore his best friend's memories, the Hydra plot is exposed, and in the aftermath, S.H.I.E.L.D. collapses, leaving the Avengers without the oversight and support of the larger organization. That power vacuum leads directly to Tony Stark and Bruce Banner attempting to create an artificial intelligence that would help protect the world. Unfortunately, they goofed that plan up big time, instead creating a genocidal robot named Ultron who winds up destroying an entire city, resulting in the breakup of the country Sokovia. Immediately after the battle, the Hulk hijacks a Quinjet and blasts off to space, eventually landing on Sakaar. Hoping for an ally against Ultron, Tony and Bruce combine the Mind Stone, a synthesized body created by Ultron, and Tony's onboard AI, Jarvis, into a much more heroic AI called the Vision. Also, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, two definitely not mutants, join the team. Speedster Quicksilver immediately dies, partly from bullets but mostly because Disney and Fox were having a problem figuring out the character's film rights. The destruction in Sokovia also kills the family of Helmut Zemo, who then dedicates his life to revenge. While all that's going on, Peter Quill is out in space on a job to steal a valuable orb, which, unbeknownst to him, contains the Infinity Stone known as the Power Stone. That puts him in the sights of both Ronan the Accuser, who's been looking for another Infinity Stone since 1995, and Thanos, who sends Gamora after him. Quill and Gamora wind up running across Drax, a very literal warrior whose family was killed by Thanos, Rocket, the cybernetically enhanced raccoon, and Groot, a tree. After being in prison together, the five of them stage a jailbreak, defeat Ronan in a dance-off, recover the Power Stone with the help of the real power, which is friendship. During the adventure, Groot dies, leaving behind a baby Groot sapling, and the group christens themselves the Guardians of the Galaxy. They turn the Power Stone over to the Nova Corps, a bunch of space cops on the planet Xandar. Shortly thereafter, Thanos attacks Xandar and recovers it for himself. In 2015, an electrical engineer named Scott Lang gets out of prison and stumbles onto Hank Pym's old size-changing equipment. Under the guidance of Pym and his daughter Hope, Lang becomes the second Ant-Man and helps to keep the Pym particles from falling into the hands of evil arms dealer Darren Cross. When Darren dons his own size-changing suit and becomes the villainous Yellow Jacket, Lang goes subatomic and damages Yellow Jacket's suit so badly that the bad guy seemingly shrinks into oblivion. Actually, Cross journeys to the Quantum Realm, where he's found by Kang and rebuilt as Modok, the mechanized organism designed only for killing. More importantly, it's likely somewhere around this time that a kid named Peter Parker is bitten by a radioactive spider tries to capitalize on his powers by becoming famous as Spider-Man, and fails to stop a robber that later kills his Uncle Ben. None of this is actually covered in the MCU, but you might have seen five other movies about it. The following year sees Helmut Zemo's plan to destroy the Avengers reach its fruition. As the world responds to the destruction of Sokovia by trying to install new governmental oversight over the Avengers, Zemo furthers a wedge between Captain America and Iron Man by revealing that Bucky was the one who killed Tony Stark's parents. He also frames Bucky for the assassination of King T'Chaka of Wakanda, leaving the king's son, T'Challa, to take over leadership of the country, not to mention the identity and powers of the Black Panther. The end result of all of this is that the Avengers break up, the ones loyal to Cap go underground, and T'Challa refuses to give Zemo the death he desires. Bucky also gets safe refuge and treatment in Wakanda after T'Challa realizes they were all being manipulated by Zemo. Fleeing the US after the rest of Cap's team is in prison, Natasha Romanoff spends some time in Norway watching James Bond films. Unfortunately, her vacation is cut short when she's attacked by Taskmaster an assassin who can mimic any fighting style. Later, she discovers Taskmaster is the brainwashed daughter of a still-alive General Drakoff, who has restarted a crueler version of the Red Room that brainwashes new Black Widows and robs them of free will. One of those Black Widows turns out to be Natasha's sister, Yelena. Freed of her programming by another widow, Yelena sends the brainwashing antidote to Natasha, drawing her into the fight. Together, Yelena and Natasha work to reunite with their former parents, Alexei and Melina, and really kill Drakoff this time. 
Although the dysfunctional Deep Cover family has more than its share of issues, they manage to pull together and take down the Red Room. In the end, Yelena gets to work liberating Black Widows around the world while Natasha goes to break her other family, the Avengers, out of jail. While all this is going on, Dr. Stephen Strange, who lost the fine motor control in his hands after a car accident, seeks out the Ancient One and trains to become a master of the mystic arts. He stops an invasion by Dormammu, a demonic force from the Dark Dimension, by using the Time Stone to trap Dormammu in a time loop where the entity kills Strange over and over again until the cosmic villain gets annoyed enough to leave Earth alone. Meanwhile, the Guardians of the Galaxy encounter Ego and Peter Quill's half-sister, Mantis. Ego reveals that Peter is his son and the heir to his power, but when he tries to manipulate him into conquering the entire galaxy, Mantis teams up with the Guardians to kill the living planet. The Guardians also incur the wrath of the Sovereign after Rocket steals some of their batteries for absolutely no reason. In retaliation, their leader, Aisha, decides to create a more powerful Sovereign named Adam to go after the Guardians. In the absence of the Avengers, Tony Stark begins to mentor Peter Parker. As Spider-Man, Peter tries to deal with the evil arms dealer known as the Vulture, aka Adrian Toomes, who turns out to be his homecoming date's dad. The Vulture is defeated, arrested, and sent to prison, but not before he and several of Peter's classmates figure out Spider-Man's real identity. Also, Tony Stark finally proposes to Pepper Potts. Lest you think Peter is the only super-powered teenager in the MCU, over in New Orleans, teenagers Tandy Bowen and Tyrone Johnson acquire powers of light and darkness and become the vigilante's cloak and dagger. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, privileged teenager Alex Wilder and his friends learn their parents are all supervillains who control a powerful criminal organization called the Pride. The kids go on the run, learn many of them have superpowers or connections to advanced technology, and even run afoul of dangerous artifacts like the Darkhold. Sadly, it looks like Peter won't be meeting any of these young heroes, as their worlds are only slightly connected to the MCU. Meanwhile, Mark Spector marries Layla El Fuli, the daughter of one of the archaeologists he failed to save the night he became Moon Knight. The two go on many adventures together, but when Spectre learns Khonshu may use Layla as his new avatar, he sends divorce papers to her, hoping to create some distance between them and keep her safe. In Asgard, Thor returns from two years of looking for Infinity Stones in various realms, only to discover Loki's been posing as Odin this entire time. When Thor and Loki find the real Odin, he's at the end of his life, and his death allows Hela to escape her millennia of imprisonment. She destroys Mjolnir, blasts the two brothers into space, and takes over Asgard. Thor winds up on Sakaar, where he recruits Hulk and Valkyrie for a mission to overthrow Hela, which goes about as well as it can for a plan that ends with the complete destruction of Asgard via Fire Giant. In Wakanda, T'Challa's rule is challenged by his cousin Eric Killmonger, who teams up with evil arms dealer Ulysses Claw and then betrays him in order to gain favor with Wakandans who know Claw as a vibranium smuggler. Eric nearly kills T'Challa, usurps his position as the Black Panther, and destroys all of Wakanda's heart-shaped herbs to secure his power base. After being presumed dead, T'Challa returns, and aided by Nakia, Okoye, and Shuri, regains control of his country. Later, he secretly fathers a son with Nakia, who decides to raise her child in Haiti, away from the Black Panther's enemies. After six years of waiting around, Thanos decides to personally seek out the Infinity Stones, and the results are devastating. He kills Loki, sacrifices his daughter Gamora to get the Soul Stone, and nearly obliterates the last surviving Asgardians. As he goes after the remaining stones, things get so desperate that the whole Avengers crew need to get back together to sort it out, except Hawkeye and Ant-Man, who are under house arrest for violating the Sokovia Accords. They don't do so well. Despite fighting on two fronts, with one small team in space and a massive force on Earth, Thanos gathers the stones, snaps his fingers, and kills half the life forms in the universe, dissolving them into dust. Before he dissolves, Nick Fury uses the space pager to alert Captain Marvel that Earth needs her help. A month later, Captain Marvel and the surviving Avengers track Thanos down in space, only to find out that he's destroyed the stones and, with them, any chance of bringing back the dead half of the universe. Thor beheads Thanos, and the Avengers return home. Ant-Man and his friends miss all of these events due to their involvement in a relatively self-contained heist movie. Alongside Scott Lang and the new Wasp, Hope Van Dyne, 
Hank Pym suits up and explores the quantum realm in order to save the original Wasp, Janet. Meanwhile, the team fends off repeated attacks from a mysterious, superpowered being known as Ghost. Later, Lang explores the quantum realm just as Thanos' snap turns Hank Pym and both Van Dyne women into dust, trapping Ant-Man in the subatomic realm. While he's there, five years go by, during which the heroes deal with the horrific trauma in various ways. Notably, Tony Stark and Pepper Potts have a daughter named Morgan, Banner merges his brain with the Hulk, and Thor becomes an overweight gamer after helping to found New Asgard in Norway. Hawkeye loses his entire family in the snap, causing him to go rogue. He adopts a new hairstyle and anti-hero identity as the merciless Ronin, who hunts down and ruthlessly kills criminals around the world. One of these criminals is William Lopez, the father of fighting prodigy Maya. After seeing her dad die, Maya swears vengeance on Ronan, not knowing that her dad's boss, Kingpin, wanted William dead. After Ant-Man returns from the quantum realm, where for him only a few hours have passed, the heroes realize that the solution to the problem is, of course, time travel. With the help of Iron Man, Rocket, a reformed Nebula, and the now smart Hulk, the heroes travel back to various key points in the timeline, including 1970, 2012, and 2014, to gather up the Infinity Stones of those eras, along with Molnir, circa 2013. Unfortunately, the Avengers also inadvertently bring the Thanos of 2014 forward to 2023, along with all of his minions. This includes an alternate Gamora, with no memory of her time with the Guardians. Fortunately, the Hulk uses a rebuilt Infinity Gauntlet to wish everyone back to life, and virtually every hero in the entire MCU takes Thanos on at once. The final blow is dealt by Iron Man, who dies on the battlefield. After gathering for a funeral, Steve Rogers hops into the time stream to return everything to where it should be, returning after living a full life with Peggy Carter in an alternate past to bequeath his shield to Sam Wilson, naming him the new Captain America. Outside of the mainstream MCU, the version of Loki that the Avengers freed from an alternate 2012 in Avengers Endgame ends up in the Gobi Desert, where he immediately begins fulfilling his glorious purpose by trying to conquer the world again. Instead, he gets picked up by the Time Variance Authority, or TVA, a time police force tasked with hunting down rogue variants like Loki and destroying alternate timelines before they can branch out too far from their sacred timeline. Loki gets paired with Mobius, a sympathetic TVA agent who recruits the trickster god into the agency to help find their latest target, another Loki variant. This isn't about you. This variant turns out to be a female version of Loki called Sylvie, who restarts the multiverse, allowing a bunch of rogue timelines to emerge from history. Loki teams up with Sylvie and discovers the TVA is made up of variants forcibly recruited into the organization to prune rogue timelines and prevent really evil versions of the TVA's mysterious leader, another variant of Kang, from destroying everything. While offered a chance to let this deception persist, Sylvie instead murders the mastermind, letting the multiverse run wild. While this may lead to the destruction of reality, it makes one cosmic being's life more interesting. The godlike voyeur The Watcher observes realities in which Peggy Carter receives the super soldier serum, Doctor Strange destroys his universe, and Thor becomes a party animal. Ultimately, The Watcher is forced to evolve from observer to doer when a variant Ultron threatens to destroy all sentient life in the multiverse. Assembling his own Guardians of the Multiverse team, The Watcher manipulates events so the alternate realities can continue to coexist. Sometime after the multiverse was recreated, a young girl named America Chavez develops the ability to travel through alternate realities. Unable to control her power, she accidentally sends her parents to an unknown world before slipping through multiple parallel universes herself. Along the way, she makes friends, usually with variants of Doctor Strange. In the mainstream MCU, the effects of Hulk's reverse snap are being felt on both a cosmic and street level. People like Yelena Belova and Monica Rambeau snap back to existence, only to discover that five years have passed and their loved ones are now gone. Re-establishing their lives proves difficult, since different people live in their homes and billions are still legally dead. While support networks form, entire nations are also forcing out recent immigrants due to the sudden rise in population. Believing life was better during the blip when half of all life was gone, some people react to these changes violently. 
Anarchist Carly Morgenthau forms a terrorist group, the Flag Smashers, to attack governments threatening her one-world vision and even augments her team with a new version of the Super Soldier Serum. This puts her in the sights of Sam Wilson, who rejects Steve Rogers' request that he become the new Captain America. After working with Bucky Barnes and seeing how Steve's legacy can be tarnished by unworthy successors like the dangerously unhinged John Walker, Sam takes on the mantle of Captain America and stops the Flag Smashers. Taking advantage of the global chaos and recent superpower debuts, a mysterious woman named Valentina Allegra de Fontaine begins recruiting enhanced individuals, including Yelena Belova and John Walker, for an unknown project. Meanwhile, Peggy Carter's niece, Sharon, a former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, goes rogue and begins selling U.S. government weapons to terrorists as the power broker of the island nation of Madripoor. Sam also meets an elderly Isaiah Bradley and learns his history. Although Isaiah is skeptical about the idea of a black Captain America, Sam arranges for an exhibit of Isaiah's service to be displayed at the Smithsonian so everyone will know about the United States' first African-American super soldier. The sudden rise in sentient life on Earth also jumpstarts the emergence, which threatens to destroy the entire planet when a new celestial is born. Alerted by the cosmic event and a few remaining deviants, the Eternals reunite. Where before they have always stood by and allowed planets to be destroyed, a few now have enough love for humanity to try and save the Earth. Cersei draws enough power from her teammates to halt the birth of the Celestial Tiamat, and the Celestial Erisham uses the Eternal's memories to determine if Earth should be spared. In Europe, Peter Parker attempts to have a vacation free of Spider-Man. Unfortunately, this becomes impossible when Nick Fury, actually the shape-shifting Skrull, Talos, who is covering for Fury while he's on vacation in space, recruits Spider-Man to help Mysterio, a man claiming to be from an alternate universe, to save the world from dangerous elemental beings. Except it's all a lie. Mysterio is just Quentin Beck, a disgruntled ex-Stark employee who uses Peter to get his hands on a pair of Stark Tech sunglasses that can control an army of weaponized drones. Spider-Man gets the drop on Mysterio's illusions to keep him from killing thousands of people. But in a final act of spite, Mysterio exposes Peter's secret identity to the world. Meanwhile, former assassin turned car valet Shang Chi, currently going by Sean, learns his father is gunning for him when Ten Rings agents steal the jade pendant his mother left him. Teaming up with his sister, Shang Chi finally addresses his issues with his father by traveling to Talo and stopping Wenwu from unleashing the soul sucking monster known as the Dweller in Darkness on the world. Before dying to save his son, Wenwu grants Shang-Chi the Ten Rings, which begins sending signals out into the universe. While all this is going on, one rogue Avenger is unknowingly creating her own brand of chaos in the small town of Westview, New Jersey. Unable to cope with the loss of Vision, who Thanos kills by ripping the Mind Stone out of his head, Wanda Maximoff manifests powerful reality-warping abilities. Drawing from her childhood love of American sitcoms, Wanda warps Westview into an idyllic town where she lives a suburban life with a new version of Vision. She even gives birth to twin boys who quickly mature in a single episode. To maintain this illusion, Wanda inadvertently mind-controls the real-life citizens of Westview into becoming her personal puppets. Her activities attract the attention of the new intelligence agency S.W.O.R.D. and Agatha Harkness. While Wanda eventually comes to her senses and tries to free Westview, Agatha goads Wanda into a battle. Wanda comes out on top, however, and although she has to sacrifice her happy life with her husband and children, she embraces her new role as the Scarlet Witch. She also takes Agatha's Darkhold and starts dreaming of alternate realities where her sons are still alive. Wanda's reality-warping abilities also permanently alter one woman, sword agent Captain Monica Rambo. The adult daughter of Carol Danvers' best friend Maria, Monica attempts to help Wanda with her grief and is exposed multiple times to Wanda's hex energies. This rewrites Monica's cells, giving her the power to absorb energy and become intangible. After hearing of her performance in Westview, Nick Fury sends a scroll to ask Monica to join him on a mission in outer space. With his secret identity now exposed, Peter turns to Doctor Strange, hoping the sorcerer can snap his fingers and wish his problems away. Instead, Strange offers to cast a spell to make the world forget Peter Parker as Spider-Man. It seems like an ideal solution, until Peter keeps asking Strange to rewrite the spell, 
creating multiple fractures in the multiverse and drawing in people who know Peter Parker as Spider-Man. Soon, Spider-Man villains from different cinematic universes, including Doctor Octopus, Sandman, The Lizard, and Electro, begin slipping into the MCU. However, the worst new arrival is the Green Goblin, who kills Peter's Aunt May. Distraught, Peter receives help from an unexpected source, two multiverse Peter Parkers who look a lot like Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire. Together, the Spider-Men concoct some creative cures for their enemies and depower their shared rogues gallery. But just as things seem to be looking up, the multiverse begins to fracture. Peter does the responsible thing by asking Strange to make the whole world forget Peter Parker and prevent the villains from coming through. This essentially makes Peter a non-entity in the MCU, cuts him off from his support network of heroes and friends, and sets him up for a brand new trilogy of solo Spider-Man films. Oh, and Strange's spell also strands the Vulture in Sony's universe, while Sony's Venom briefly pops up in the MCU. Instead of fighting Spider-Man, he spends his entire visit getting drunk in a Mexican bar and accidentally gives birth to a new symbiote whom he unknowingly abandons in the MCU. However, not all heroes need to be alone for the holidays. After a now 22-year-old Kate Bishop crashes an underground New York auction and steals Clint Barton's former Ronin outfit, she draws a lot of unwanted and potentially lethal attention to herself from the tracksuit mafia and Kingpin. Fortunately, Hawkeye is in town with his family to see the embarrassingly catchy Rogers the Musical. Initially hoping to retrieve his Ronin suit and keep Kate out of trouble, Clint ends up mentoring Kate as they go up against Maya Lopez, aka Echo, Yelena Belova, and Kingpin. After bonding with Clint over their shared trauma and showing she's really good at shooting people with trick arrows, Kate looks like she'll be taking over the mantle of Hawkeye and joining the MCU's ever-expanding roster of new superheroes. A now teenaged America Chavez is pursued by demonic agents that kill a variant Doctor Strange. America and Strange's corpse accidentally slip into the mainstream Marvel Universe. Our Doctor Strange discovers that Wanda Maximoff, now corrupted by the Darkhold, wants to steal America's multiverse-traveling powers so she can live in a world where her twin sons are alive. When Strange and the Sorcerers of Kamertage stand in her way, Wanda murders the Sorcerers forcing America and Strange to flee to Earth-838. There, Strange is arrested by this universe's Illuminati, a secret society that includes alternate versions of Baron Mordo, Black Bolt, Captain Carter, Captain Marvel, Professor Charles Xavier, and Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four. Believing Strange to be the real threat to the multiverse, the Illuminati fail to heed Strange's warnings of the Scarlet Witch. This becomes their undoing when Wanda travels to Earth-838 by possessing the body of her alternate self and slaughters the Illuminati. She then banishes Strange to another alternate world, where Strange learns his variant is an arrogant jerk who brought about the end of his universe. Using this world's Darkhold, Strange possesses the body of the dead Doctor Strange variant on his homeworld and battles Wanda. Fortunately, America is able to get Wanda to see the error of her ways by taking her back to Earth-838, where her sons are horrified by how evil she's become. Filled with remorse, Wanda collapses the structure on Mount Wondagore and destroys the Darkhold in all realities before seemingly killing herself. Sometime later, Strange, now sporting a third eye thanks to his use of the Darkhold, encounters the Dark Dimension's sorceress Clea, who tells him he started an incursion in her home reality. Strange and Clea then leap into the Dark Dimension, indicating that as the Marvel Cinematic Universe continues to expand, we won't be dealing with just one universe, but several. Across the pond in London, mild-mannered gift shop employee Stephen Grant suffers from regular blackouts and discovers he's an alternate personality of Mark Spector, the Moon Knight. After Mark suffers a breakdown following the death of his mother, Stephen takes over their body and gets a job at the National Art Gallery. Despite being mistreated by his co-workers, Stephen maintains his positive outlook and tries to live a peaceful life. This life is thrown into chaos when Arthur Harrow, a former avatar of Khonshu, resurfaces as the new avatar of Amit, the Egyptian goddess of divine retribution. Hoping to preemptively stop all evil by destroying everyone before they get a chance to perform a wicked act, Harrow and his cult free Amit and send people to their deaths before their time. To stop him, Stephen and Mark team up with Layla, who acquires superpowers of her own by becoming the avatar of the goddess Tawaret, and manage to imprison Ament in Harrow's mortal form. 
Although Stephen manages to broker a deal with Khonshu to release Mark and him from the Moon God's service, he doesn't realize that Mark has a third personality, the homicidal Jake Lockley, who's still killing people for Khonshu. After months of adventuring with the Guardians of the Galaxy, Thor has recovered from the crippling depression for failing to prevent Thanos' snap. He learns the terrifying Gore the God Butcher has been slaughtering gods across the cosmos with his ultra-powerful Necrosword. With the help of King Valkyrie and the new female Thor, revealed to be Thor's ex-girlfriend, Jane Foster, Thor defeats Gore, but not without cost. Foster dies and travels to the Norse afterlife of Valhalla. Following her wishes, Thor takes in Gore's superpowered daughter, who goes by the name Love. Thor's actions have earned him new mortal enemies in the Greek god Zeus and his son Hercules, who vow revenge on Thor and the rest of Earth's heroes. In New Jersey, a young Avengers superfan named Kamala Khan finds herself in a generations-old feud between an organization of Pakistani protectors known as the Order of the Red Daggers and a group of interdimensional invaders known as the Clandestines. Kamala discovers that she is a descendant of the Clandestines, and therefore a super-powered mutant hybrid. With the help of her friends, and through a series of trials that allow her to master her newfound powers, Kamala expels the invading clandestines and saves Earth, in the process, settling on the moniker Ms. Marvel. Meanwhile, the superhero community continues to grow, after a car accident causes attorney Jennifer Walters to absorb the gamma-irradiated blood of her cousin Bruce Banner, she becomes a Hulk herself. Instead of fighting crime through vigilantism, Walters elects to use her new insider perspective to represent super beings in court. Who the hell are you? Jennifer Walters, attorney at law. Working with the law firm of GLK&H in Los Angeles, She-Hulk handles cases involving the Abomination, Wong, Titania, and more. In Wakanda, King T'Challa contracts a mysterious disease and becomes terminally ill. Shuri attempts to save his life by constructing an artificial heart-shaped herb to replace the ones Eric Killmonger destroyed. However, she doesn't have enough time, and T'Challa dies. Over in Cambridge, Massachusetts, teen prodigy Riri Williams runs a private business doing her classmates homework for money. She uses the cash to fund her own private projects, including an Iron Man-style armored suit. One of her designs, a vibranium detector she created for her metallurgy class, is appropriated by the CIA, which uses it to seek out vibranium deposits on Earth. Unfortunately, this allows them to uncover the underwater kingdom of Telokon, placing the United States in conflict with Namor's people. Namor approaches Queen Ramonda and Shuri in Wakanda and shows them the vibranium detector, telling them he wants the scientist who built it. Concerned, Shuri and Okoye travel to MIT to warn Riri, but both Riri and Shuri are then taken prisoner by the Telokanil. Namor proposes an alliance between Wakanda and Telokan, but when Shuri and Riri escape, Namor attacks Wakanda and Queen Ramonda is killed. Using a Telokan plant to recreate the heart-shaped herb, Shuri becomes the new Black Panther and leads Wakanda against the attacking forces. Vengeance has consumed us. We cannot let it consume our people. Although she craves vengeance, she chooses to show Namor mercy and establish a peaceful alliance between their two nations. In the aftermath, Shuri is able to let go of her guilt over her brother's death and is introduced to Nakia's son, Tusan, or as the Wakandans will come to know him, Prince T'Challa. Back on Earth, Scott Lang attempts to retire from superheroics while promoting his memoir, Look Out for the Little Guy. This upsets his daughter, Cassie, who feels the world still needs heroes. She invents a quantum satellite, which can send signals to the quantum realm and learn if people in the subatomic world need help. While testing it, the signal gets hijacked and Scott, Cassie, Hank, Janet, and Hope are sucked through a portal into the quantum realm. In the quantum realm, Janet comes face to face with her past when she learns Kang has turned the realm into his totalitarian kingdom. Scott and Cassie are captured by the ruler and reunite with Darren Cross, now Kang's delusional minion, Modok. After Kang forces Ant-Man to steal back his power core so he can exit the quantum realm, Cassie escapes and teams up with a group of rebels to lead an uprising against the evil tyrant. They're aided by Janet, Hope, Hank, a reformed Modok, and Hank's team of hyper-evolved ants. In the end, Hope helps Scott destroy both the power core and Kang before they return to Earth. However, this isn't the end of Kang, as variants are now emerging from all over the multiverse. 
Out in space, Peter Quill is in a deep depression after losing Gamora and seeing her alternate variant depart for places unknown. Wanting to help her brother with his grief, Mantis teams up with Drax to travel to Earth and get Peter a special Christmas gift. Footloose actor Kevin Bacon. While Star-Lord is horrified by the kidnapping, Bacon chooses to celebrate Christmas with the Guardians after hearing how his films inspired Peter to save the universe by dancing. Mantis later tells Peter of their shared parentage, reminding him that he still has family in the stars. Things take a darker turn when the Sovereign's new creation, Adam Warlock, attacks Nowhere and critically injures Rocket. After learning the High Evolutionary installed a kill switch in Rocket's cybernetic implants to stop anyone from treating him, the team travels to the High Evolutionary's planet Counter-Earth to save their friend. In the process, they reunite with Gamora, who has joined the Ravagers. Together, the Guardians of the Galaxy save Rocket and defeat the High Evolutionary. In the aftermath, Peter returns to Earth to be with his grandfather, Gamora goes back to the Ravagers, Mantis embarks on a voyage of self-discovery, and Drax and Nebula turn nowhere into a sanctuary for displaced people and races. This leaves Rocket, now the captain of the Guardians, to build a new team consisting of an adult Groot, the Ravager Kraglin, Cosmo the Space Dog, High Evolutionary Experiment Phyla, and a reformed Adam Warlock.